Good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our Feroiga Career Coaching Clinic webinar, focusing on career industry innovators and entrepreneurs. This career coaching webinar is an exciting initiative created by Feroiga to provide young people with an opportunity to learn about careers and professions that they may be considering. Feroiga is a leading youth organisation engaging one in 10 young people across Ireland. Freud encourages young people to take responsibility for themselves and to be part of shaping the world around them. You can get involved through your local club or you can avail of one of the many programs Freud offers, like Leadership, Nifty and the Be Healthy, Be Happy program. If you would like to find out more, please visit www.feroiga.ie. With us tonight are our panellists Mags O'Connor and Dara O'Rourke. This evening's webinar will be a mixture of speakers and interviews. These career webinars are designed to give you, young people, an insight into professions and to inform young people's choices. You will still need to consult with your career guidance about specific questions around courses or the CAO system. Throughout the webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. You will notice along the bottom of your screen there is a Q&A feature. We strongly encourage all attendees to use this function and to get involved. At the end of the webinar, we will be running an evaluation poll. It will take less than a minute and we would really appreciate everyone taking the time to complete it. So first up tonight, we have Mags O'Connor, a highly motivated and dynamic professional with 20 years experience working in strategic marketing and management. Mags specialities include innovation, entrepreneurship, business management and growth, mentoring, marketing, and coaching and training. Mags, you're very welcome uh, tonight and thank you very much for joining us. I'm gonna hand it over to you now because I know you have a presentation there, so you're very welcome tonight. Thanks a million, Jim, and thanks very much for having me. Um, I can hopefully share something that might be of interest or of help to you guys out there tonight. So as Jim um, I said, my career spans about 20 years at this stage. Um, I know it's hard to believe when I look so young. Um, so my current role is I'm a principal officer in revenue. And what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is I'm just going to talk through my journey, how I got to where I am today. Um, I certainly didn't when I was in school. Um, I didn't take any business subjects. I didn't take accounting. I didn't take business studies. I did not see myself ending up um, in a tax administration. So I'll talk you through how I got to where I am today. Um, I'll talk about my biggest lesson in terms of growing up, biggest lesson to date. Um, I'll talk you through a day in my life um, just to give you some idea of what it's like to work in the kind of role that I work in. Um, I'll talk you through, I suppose, from my perspective or and based on advice I've gotten from people who are much wiser than me. Um, I'll share some of that advice and I'll finish up then with just what inspires me. And then at that stage, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. So I suppose the first thing that I want to say, and I think it's so important um, that you realize this, people think success is going X, Y, Z, end game, and there I am. In reality, it's a series of ups and downs and about turns and circles and jumps and uh, through obstacles, under obstacles, over obstacles. And, you know, there are days when things will seem like they're going really well and then things can go off completely off kilter and something that makes you really happy um, at one phase in your life. Um, I know certainly in my career, when I talked through my journey, I would be talking about how I loved, um, I started out in marketing and I loved it for a long time. And then I lost the grow for it. And, you know, um, I kind of felt like I painted myself into a corner with it, but actually, you know, you're never really stuck in a corner with anything. There's always a way around it. So success is a squiggly line, essentially. Um, and that brings me into my journey. So when I finished school, um, I now I, I liked school, I have to say, I liked school and I was good in school. Um, but I came from, um, we didn't have much money at home and there was three kids younger than me coming up behind me. So I was in a situation where my parents, plain and simply, didn't have the money to send me to college. I wanted to go, and um, so I suppose there is that, that was, I wanted it. Um, but it just, there was three kids coming behind me, as I said. So basically my parents said, look, go out and get yourself a job, get some money together, and put yourself through. So that's basically what I did. Um, but I started, I worked in Supermax and I worked for three three years and I saved really hard to put myself into a position um, that I could go to college. And um, I went to WIT, um, which is actually where 
I met Erica there. <laughs> so I um, studied in WIT, I studied languages and marketing. And I, I loved the marketing side. Um, I really, really loved it. I enjoyed, I did French and Spanish. Um, and I thought, I did enjoy the languages at the time. I thought I would probably use them. Um, I saw myself being in a job maybe overseas doing marketing. Um, but I didn't quite land there. I ended up, I went to Galway after college and I joined a company called Life's Too Good, which was um, it's an organization that's um, it's basically a direct sales organization and they sell kind of lifestyle products. So pills to lose weight and, you know, products, fitness products and things like that. And I was using a bit of my French there for um, dealing with some French customers. And, you know, it, it was pretty much a um, little bow on it, what I, what I thought I'd be doing after college. Um, and I loved um, the job. So I stayed at that for a while. And then I got an opportunity. I, I kind of wanted to progress and work in something where I could kind of have more of an impact on the marketing. So I got a job with Sayat. And I worked there for a few years um, in their department. And I suppose what I would say about a big international company like Say It is that you get exposed to a lot of really interesting work. Again, um, interacting with things from overseas. And, you know, you, you kind of just get to see things from a very different perspective when you work for a big company. So from there, I moved on and I went to work for a company called ABB. And that was another big multinational. And it was at this stage that I started to have, a, I suppose, a kind of crisis. Um, in that I just realised I really wasn't loving what I was doing anymore. So I was here, I, 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 wasn't in, I wasn't getting any joy out of it anymore. And the whole big company thing at that point, it's very, a big company is great for exposing you to lots of other people and, you know, um, kind of, there's a lot of kind of exciting work goes on. But what happens in a big company is that you're in a specific area and your field or your job can be quite narrow. So it, it what, you know, it does not, can be the case, not always the case, but certainly in my experience, my jobs became very narrow and I didn't have a lot of variety and I was kind of craving variety. And I had always thought that I would probably set up a business of my own. And um, so at that point, I, I applied for a master's um, and I went back to WIT and it was a full-time program and there was a, a job with the program. So you were doing your master's while you were working for WIT. Now, a lot of people thought I was crazy at the time because I took a huge drop in salary. Um, and, you know, I gave up the security of this international company where I had, you know, a lot of benefits, but I wasn't happy. So I suppose that's one of the key things that I learned. Um, I was around 30, I think, um, when I made this decision. And a lot of people thought, you know, a lot of people said to me, what are you doing? But you kind of have to go with, if, if you know you're not happy, you know, you have the power to make the change. So I went and I made the change. And at that point, um, while working there, I did try out my first business, um, which was the brown rubbish bins. There's bags that go in them that are fully compostable. And um, I basically set up a business with a friend where we were importing those. Um, it didn't work out, but look, you, we learned a lot from it. And it didn't work out because we were headed for recession at the time. And unfortunately, um, after I had finished the master's in the program that I had been working on in WIT finished up, I found myself out of work. So I suppose in the space of a few years, I went from this big corporate job where I was doing well by a lot of people's standards um, to being out of work. So at this point, I had come across um, a, a woman, an entrepreneur, and um, while I was trying to set up my business, I'd come across this woman and her company was called Passion for Creative. And her name is Jill and she's a fabulous, fabulous entrepreneur and a really, you know, inspiring woman. So I actually went to her. I was out of work at the time and I went to her. I said, look, if I can prove that I can bring business into you, will you give me a job? So we had a deal that I would work for her for six months. And if I could prove that there was a job in it for me, she would give me a job. And um, so I went and I did that. So that was when I worked and um, Jim mentioned about business development. I worked in business development for her. So bringing in um, new clients and um, getting people to buy her services. And um, so I ended up I ended up working with her for a couple of years. And, um, you know, she really kind of that experience kind of really built my confidence back up again. So from there um, I went to work for Dungarvan Enterprise Centre. 
So an enterprise centre is like a, a hub that supports startup enterprises. So I worked there and for five years, actually, I really enjoyed it. I was working with people who were setting up businesses and I was helping them to access the help that's out there for businesses. So through the likes of the local enterprise office, but it really gave me good exposure to small businesses. And um, it helped, I tried, I had another business idea, which I tried out at this stage. And um, again, it didn't, unfortunately it didn't work out. Um, it was very crowded market space. I was trying um, for a health and fitness and um, weight loss um, program. Um, but look, the, the the job really helped me get that out of my system as such. And when I was there about three years, um, I, at that point, I kind of thought to myself, I needed to retrain a bit. So I did um, a postgraduate uh, diploma in innovation with UCC at that stage. And one of the things that that postgraduate diploma exposed for me was I did a strategy audit on the company that I was working for. And what it showed me is that I needed to get out of there because I had been there at startup and that company needed somebody else to come in and push it along. So it just made me really think about where I was going. And it was at that point that I thought, OK, what do I want to do for the next, I suppose, third of my career? And um, I moved at that stage into the local employment service where I worked with helping people who were out of work. And I made a decision that that was going to segue me into a career in the civil service. So I then applied for the civil service and um, I came into the civil service and got a role in revenue. Um, and the way that the civil service works, um, you apply through a central, central part called the public appointment service. You apply there and you get assigned to one of the many departments in the civil service. And I suppose some of the benefits in there are career progression. And there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities in there for um, progression and building a career. You can learn about lots of different areas. And um, I landed in revenue and I didn't have a notion about tax. It was something I had never done. So um, I did a tax diploma and um, learned enough to be able to do my job and I got promoted then and I am um, I'm still with revenue uh, the career isn't over yet but that's where I am at the moment and you know I'm really enjoying it and it suits me for where I am in my life but I never say I will always be somewhere and um, but I will say that the civil service is an option you might not have considered it but it is an option for people who are interested in building a career and you don't have to stay there forever and um, the biggest lesson that I've learned, um, and you'll see I did a bit of job hopping, like the biggest lesson I learned is there is no perfect job. When I left school, I thought I had this idea in my head that once I went to college and I got this job, it was going to be perfect. And, you know, you know that saying, um, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's actually really misleading because even if you're doing something that you love, there are going to be bits of it that you actually hate because there are tedious boring parts to every single job and that's just the reality of it some people love admin that won't be the boring part for you some people love the creative side but there are bits to every job that won't be amazing but that's okay the thing is to have a job that you love most of the time you know and that most of, you know you, you feel happy going into it but if your expectations are that it's going to be perfect which were my expectations for a long time I'm sure I was setting myself up for a bit of disappointment um, so I'll just look, I'm, I'm not going to labour this because there's nothing really exciting in, in one of my days. What I will say is my day is very varied. So at the moment I'm working remotely, which means that I'm sitting exactly where I'm sitting now. Um, and I'm having meetings like this with my team. Um, I, I log on, I check my emails, I check my schedule for the day. I then go to meetings, I make decisions, um, read and write reports, I do analyses, um, I engage with people in other departments, I engage with people in other divisions, um, I work closely with people across the organisation and, you know, we do a bit of problem solving the whole time. Um, so in my day-to-day -day life, while I work in revenue, I don't actually deal directly with taxes. Um, I deal with policy around taxes and policy around how we deal with people. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a very varied day and um, I find I log on in the morning and I blink and it's over. So that's a good sign, I think, for any job. And um, I'm going to move on and I'm just going to talk about the advice that I would offer. And um, I remember many years ago going to um, a seminar and the teacher said that, sorry, the speaker said, everyone can be my teacher. And it has really, really stuck with me. 
it's really important to have an open mind. So it doesn't matter who you're talking to. Everybody has something to share. So that could be, you know, your parents, your cousins, the school janitor. It doesn't matter. Everybody has a story and everybody has something important that they can teach you if you're open to it. And, um, you know, the, the thing is to be able to accept that, you know, you're going to be learning every day. Um, the next piece of advice, which again, I was given, and I think it's probably, and this is actually um, my dad um, has always said to me, um, you know, I, I don't understand the word can't. And um, he's always said that to me. And, you know, I, I think it, it did me a lot of good. And um, it's a frame of mind. There's always another way. So, you know, even, even if your plans at the moment, um, you know, there's different ways of getting to different things. And, um, you know, you, you don't, as I said at the beginning, have to go A, B, C, D. If you can go A, Z, Y, there's lots of different ways. And the last thing then is, and this one has really helped me a lot, is that confidence is perspective, you know, and fake it till you make it. It was a, a very successful entrepreneur um, who told me a story about when she started her business and she was looking to get money from the bank and she had, she had a couple of quid in her pocket, but she went in and she absolutely went into a meeting and she, she faked the confidence. She said, I guarantee you I'm going to be selling 100,000 euros worth within my first year. And, you know, she, she really pushed it and she said herself that inside her stomach was doing somersaults, but she got her loan and her business is still going 24 years later. And um, so I think that there's something in that. So, you know, um, fake it till you make it, you know, people won't know that you're nervous about something, you know, it, it you just project that you're confident in what you're doing and it'll get you through a lot. Um, and that brings me to my last piece, which is just in terms of inspiration. Um, I always think, um, I always try to remind myself that, you know, where you are now is where you once dreamed of being. And so just, you know, be grateful for where you're at. Um, I get this little, um, it's, it's a thing that comes into my mailbox every day. It's you sign up on tut.com and it's a note from the universe every day. And it's just a little piece of positivity every day, every morning. Um, so I see that everything for every day, first thing in the morning, just a little bit of a positive way to start the day. So I'm very open to any questions that anyone has. Thanks. We might just get you to stop sharing your screen there, Mags, if you don't mind, please. Yeah. Mags, thanks very much for that presentation. It was, it was great. Um, Mags, I'm going to ask you a few things on your presentation, but there's a good few questions in there actually for you as well, so we'll get through them as well. Mags, you, you spoke about your role at the moment is, about, uh, is dealing with policies in, in relation to revenue. Can you, can, you, can you explain to us and the young people that are, are watching here tonight, what exactly is a policy? So a policy is essentially a way of doing things. And it's the do's and don'ts that frame um, a piece of work or an activity. So, you know, to put it in context, if, if anybody here is involved with, say, in a sports team, there will be some rules around that. So there'll be rules around training. What can you bring to training? What can you wear to training? And, um, you know, how many are you allowed to get picked up from training? And, um, you know, there'll be rules. So there'll be policies that are in place. And that's essentially, if you extend that into to my work, that's essentially what it is that we do. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much, Mags. Mags, you just spoke there about planning. Your, your, uh, on your weekly um, schedule is you have planning. You actually had it in twice. Uh, why is planning so important with your role? And um, it's, it's hugely important. The nature of the role is that it can get very busy. And I will compare it when you, you're coming up to exam time and you're trying to prepare and you're trying to study but you also have other things going on, right? And if you don't plan, what can happen is, we say you start into one subject and, you know, tonight was supposed to be English and maths. And then you start into the English and you really get into it. And, you know, you get dragged off on a tangent, checking out maybe some piece behind a poem or behind something. Next thing you know, there's no maths done because the night is up and you probably haven't covered everything that you wanted to cover. So that's what I would compare that to. In work, if I don't plan my day, I will go off on a tangent and I'll end up not meeting my goals. Brilliant, brilliant, Mags. Mags, a few questions in here for you. Was it hard to study marketing when you didn't have a didn't have business subjects? Um, it was it was doable, is what I would say to you. Um, you know, it it required a, a bit. I did have to put in an extra effort. 
And there were parts of it particularly that I needed extra help with. But what I will say is in that kind of setting, in college, you have help from the students' union, you have help from, and the, the lecturers will give you help. And they're usually actually students as well who provide um, support to other students, you know, students who are further along from you. So that's what I did. I tapped into, personally, I tapped into the students' union, which is, the, uh, they were able to assign me somebody who helped me. Um, but it's totally doable. Brilliant. And I know WIT have tutorials as well. So yes. if you are, yeah, so if you're, if you're falling behind a little bit, they, there is those extra support. So I'm sure other colleges have that as well. Is it stressful, uh, Mags, to work for a big company, as you mentioned earlier on? It's, 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 um, it's a very measured environment. So I don't know that it's stressful, um, but it's, it's somewhere where you need to be productive a lot of the time. Um, you know, so it's, you do have to look after yourself and you do have to kind of, you do need to have boundaries and stuff in place so yes. that you don't get overwhelmed and you need to be able to say no. So when I spoke about confidence there, I probably should have said that what I mean is like confidence to say no if you need to say no, or confidence to say, like something that often happens in work um, is you will have a piece of work and then somebody will come to you with another piece of work and another piece. And if you don't figure out which one is the priority, you can end up stressed and you can end up overwhelmed. And it's to have the confidence to say, hang on now, which one of these needs to be done first? You know, um, and that's the skill. Now you mentioned about setting up your own business and you, you were a casualty to, to the recession. And how did you go about setting up your own business, Mike? And um, so I um, had an idea and um, I went and I spoke to the, they were called the Enterprise Boards at the time. They're now called the Local Enterprise Offices. And um, so it's a state provided free service. Um, and I went and I spoke to them about the idea and they put me in touch with a mentor who battered the idea with me. In other words, they bounced the idea around and we changed it a little bit and made it more viable. And he helped me to develop a business plan. I went to the bank to, try to get money. Um, and I got, got a bit of a loan um, in order to get myself up and running. And, um, you know, I registered as a sole trader because to start off, it's easier to set up as a sole trader. Um, but you can go as a limited company as well. It's just that there's more, um, there are more, Compliance things, and um, if you're going to set up as a, as a limited company, and as it happened when I failed, it was you know I, I was lucky I suppose I was a sole trader. But I mean, when I talk about failure, there's nothing wrong with fail. I have a very American attitude towards failure, mm. and you know it's you learn from every every mistake that you make. Mm. And I suppose that's the right attitude to have when you are starting a business. You know, it's okay to fail, try again. You know, uh, because if you have that, I suppose that strength to actually start up a business, you should be have that strength to fail as well. No. Um, what do you do when you study innovation? Is a question that came in there. Okay, um, it's actually a really interesting subject. So what you look at is you look at, um, first of all, the environment for innovation. So the environment for innovation is all around having a culture of collaboration where people are open and they work with each other. You look at what else needs to be in place. A lot of it is about the space that people work in. And then you look at like what feeds innovation, creativity feeds innovation. So then you look at creativity and the process for creativity. And there are lots of different methods um, to feed that process. So you would look at the different methods. When I say different methods, like the one we're all familiar with is brainstorming. But there's also, you know, other methods like um, questioning. So, you know, you, you just asked me this question, but then you say to me, but why? But mm -hmm. why? But why? And you keep going until we get to... to, to Kind of a, an aha moment and mm. um, so it's you look at that as well and um, like what part of the the work that we did was we had to come up with new products and we had to come up with products that don't exist anywhere in the world and you had to pitch them and you had to go and you had to do like a 30 second pitch on these products and if they existed anywhere in the world you got zero percent so in order to do that i mean what's the first thing that we all do we come up with an idea you go on google it's there mm. So it's about talking then to family and friends and kind of bouncing the idea around until you get to something really different. And all of that shows you how innovation works because you have incremental innovation and then you have radical innovation. And most of us are doing the incremental stuff. Um, and that's, you know, it's actually, innovation is a great subject to study. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Sorry, now you'll probably see me looking across because I'm looking at the questions that are coming in as well. Mags, there's um, a, a question in here from Haya and... They want to know what decisions do you have to make in your job at the moment? What, what kind of decisions are you making? 
Okay, um, there's, a, it, there's a lot of decisions. Um, so it might be, um, I'll give you an example actually, um, from one of the meetings that we had today, um, we want to look at measuring um, the quality of some of the work that we do. And um, what we need to do at the moment in order to do that would be a very manual process. So we need to automate it. So mm -hmm. some decisions I have to make now uh, are whether to use something off the shelf or use a custom design, whether to build into our existing system or do a bolt on to that system. I need to look at um, whether it's going to be um, across the organization or is it going to be specific to the division that we were talking to? So I have to make all those decisions. Now I can't just, I've had that meeting, I can't just sit here and go, well, what I'm going to do is A, B, C. In order to make the decision, I have to now go off and research all of those various elements. And that will probably bring in new things that I don't know I have to make a decision on yet. Yeah, yeah. But it's essentially, it's about information gathering, analyzing the, and analyzing the information that you have, and then you make decisions from that. And what can often happen is it's, every decision is, a ch is part of a chain, and then, you know, it'll have an impact on something else. So you have to look at what are the, the effects, the wider effects, rather than just the immediate impact. Okay, very good. Uh, somebody has asked a question, what advice would you give a student about studying business? Um, oh, the advice, that, first thing that I would say to you is, if you study business, you will always have work. You will always have work and you will always have so many options. So yes, if you have an interest in business, I would encourage you to study business. And um, it's, it's a great road to go down um, and it opens up lots of possibilities and you can go and specialize into lots of different areas from it. Um, what I would say to you is to, you know, think about where you want to go and think about what area that you'd like to specialize in. And, you know, because they're generally in university or college, they'll have four streams. They'll have management, they'll have HR, they'll have um, marketing and they'll have accounting. If you go down the accounting route, you can end up in tax, which is a very interesting area. <laughs> um, if you go down the marketing route, marketing is a wonderful creative um, line of work. And, um, you know, HR is really a big and growing area. That's what I would say. And um, if you're yeah. anyway interested in it now, contrary to you might assume HR, OK, that's for people who, who like working with people. Actually, HR is not really as much of a people role as you would think. It's more of a governance role. And um, but it's really interesting because there's so much going on in the world now around there's changes around diversity and inclusion and strategic HR and building a workforce that works for the the future generation you guys that works for you guys coming through is a big big area of work and work needs to be redesigned you know the office nine to five that doesn't work anymore mm. so there's a huge there's huge opportunity in HR is what I would say and um, I know in our organization there's it's such a growing area and lots of other organizations that I would be talking to people from so sorry I'm getting over excited about that <laughs> but yeah I would say that's something that is worth considering if you think it might be of interest to you but there's lots of opportunities in business, um, lots. Mags, you've kind of touched on it, but there's another question in here. How did you know you wanted to do marketing, although you didn't do any business subjects? Um, and that, that's a great question. Um, I suppose I, when I, when I left school, I worked in Supermax for a few years, as I said. And through my work there, um, I was running um, one of the branches. And um, we used to do a bit of local marketing and, um, you know, so just a bit of advertising, kind of flyers and stuff locally. And it triggered an interest in me. Now, it was very much kind of small scale things that we were doing in the shop. But I was watching and, you know, people were responding to them. And there's a psychology to it that's really, really interesting. And there's a psychology, for example, to where you might place and, um, you know, things on the floor as in your tables or you know the mats the way that you might lead them up to the counter would have an effect on which till people would go to and it was you know those kind of things that I was doing in that job really sparked an interest in me and I thought that I I would like marketing and I did I loved it. Brilliant. Now for, uh, a question in here with so many businesses that uh, weren't successful how did you stay consistent keep on going and try again Mags? You mentioned earlier that your business failed, which it was a great idea before before the recession. But how, how did you pick yourself up and go again? Um, look, it's, um, I, I'll be honest, I felt very sorry for myself for a while. Um, and um, But what I did was, look, I just took a look at what were my options. And I will say something that I've tapped into a lot over the course of my career is coaching. 
um, I think it's invaluable. Um, it's it, it's and when I say coaching and mentoring, um, I've had a few mentors. When I say mentors, it's not a formal thing, but it's people who are a little bit older and wiser than me who I go to for ex for advice. Um, and I've learned a lot from those people, and I tapped into coaching. Actually, when the when that business, the the, the Composac business failed, I um, I did I, I spoke to my mentor who said to me, you know, look, um, maybe you need to think now about what's your next step. Do you want to kind of push up to getting into business or what do you want to do? And that was how I eventually got around to the path of being in Dungarvan Enterprise Centre. When the other business, when the weight loss business failed, um, I actually undertook coaching with a career coach um, and just took a look at it kind of needed to reevaluate what I wanted um, from what I was doing. And um, she helped me to do that. And, you know, there was a bit of lick in the wounds as well. Um, yeah. But, you know, you just kind of have to get on with it then. Exactly. And last question, what is your favourite part of your current role? Um, the variety, 100% it's the variety. Um, no two days are the same. I can honestly say not even two parts of the day are the same. Um, you know, that it's it's really different. And because there's so much, like like revenue covers so much, it's not just tax. They look after tax, excise, customs, um, and that's massive. Like there's loads and loads and loads of stuff that goes on. Um, and the world is really interesting at the moment with the way that um, businesses are all online and digital taxation and cryptocurrency and there's just, there, there's so much going on in it. Every day is a school day. So that's what I love. Brilliant. Mags, Mags, you did it. You made revenue interesting. Well done. Uh, we'll be back. <laughs> we'll be back on to you later on when we pull the panel together. For now, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, our final panelist tonight is Dara O'Rourke. Dara is Managing Director of Actus, a company at the forefront of innovation and animal nutrition. Dara holds a degree in agricultural science. Dara has always had a keen interest in animal nutrition and trying to improve the conditions and performance levels of animals. This interest drove Dara to set up his own business. Dara, you're very, very welcome tonight. And I'm going to invite Erica Reid to do an interview with you. Thank you, Jim. Um, hi, Dara. Thanks a million for agreeing to be part of tonight's panel. No problem at all, Erica. So, Dara, do you just want to give um, the young people just a quick introduction about um, yourself and, you know, how you got to be Managing Director of Actus? So just a few and we can go yeah. from uh, Basically, Actus is, um, we're an animal nutrition company, essentially, uh, predominantly we operate in the space of young animal nutrition. Um, we supply products throughout Ireland um, through the uh, uh, milling companies, cooperatives, um, agricultural merchant businesses, uh, certain building providers um, in the dairy, beef, sheep, equine and poultry sectors. Um, basically, we would have started the company, myself and another guy, John and Ann, who is the co-founders of the company about, that was in 2013, the company started. It was relatively new, I suppose, as companies go. Um, say we're in our sixth, seventh year now of actually servicing uh, the industry. Um, we would have put in probably about a year's planning before we actually started the company um, in terms of selling products. We would have put a lot of time and effort into the background, into that, made sure that we were happy, I suppose, essentially to go to market um, with the products that we presented and that, that essentially has stood to us in the test of time so far to date and we have seen great success or great growth rates over the years since since we started um, say I, I don't know if many of the young people on tonight are in the agricultural industry or are aware of, of the company Actus um, but we would have um, a lot of products in, in that sector and if there is people I'm sure to have heard of, like we would have some very strong brand names such as Champion Calf Mingo Blesser and um, Calf and Lamb Superstar Colostrum Powders which I mentioned to you, you know, um, but it was sort of born out of, at the time, a conversation I suppose between John and myself um, we, were, we were friends prior to that, we went to college together and we would have been talking over the years looking at looking at different products and saying, well, 
that actually can be done a lot better. This product here can be formulated a lot better, actually work better from a nutri nutritional point of view in animals to get their performance and actually be able to, to present it to the market cheaper and still be able to maintain the margin. And just sort of born out from conversations like that. And uh, at one stage, I leave with myself, I, I sort of get bored easily. Um, so I said to John, right, we're doing enough talking now. Maybe it's time we stop talking and actually started doing something about this and seeing where this brings us. And that's where the, the idea is both born from. And we went from there. So, um, so I might take it back a little bit, Dara. So yeah. you were in school. Did you always know you wanted to study ag science? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, I, I suppose, to be honest about it, I, I feel I was extremely lucky because I had a big interest in agriculture. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, I shouldn't be probably saying this to any young person at all, but on the leaving started on Wednesday or first English paper, uh, I was out mucking out stables on Monday, uh, where I snuck out, out of the house, put on a bicycle, rode to a stable yard, and uh, my mother picked me up at, I think, about four o'clock that evening when she realised I was gone. Um, luckily enough, I actually got a B in English, or I would have been fair bit of trouble over that you know but that was i think that was more actually luck than anything um but did you study science in school before you studied like science uh, you do biology or chemistry or physics physics. Uh, physics and chemistry was the two subjects i done in science I, I ironically enough when we were in secondary school um we had the subject agricultural science was there as a subject but the school didn't really promote it. At the time, agriculture wasn't a sort of a, it wasn't a buzz area to be in. Computer science, computers was, was the advice for career guidance was sort of, sort of being pushed down to us at that point. And uh, I remember having a conversation with the career guidance teacher saying, look, it, I want to do agriculture. This is all that's in my head. This is what I'm going to do anyway. Uh, can I do agricultural science? Because I was thinking of the points. Uh, that that was going to bring to me because I just had a bit of knowledge anyway um, and they actually wouldn't let me but <laughs> that's that's what actually it was a strange one. Um, the question you're asking what was um, ag science like in college so we did a webinar um, on agricultural science and there was a lot of questions about how much science was in it and how difficult the, the different modules that you did in college were so it it, it sort of depends on on what route you take um, I have uh, a brother who went to uh, UCD to do ag science. And I, Mark would have been five years ahead of me. And so he had finished his degree when I was just uh, entering college. I had seen that a lot of, a lot of what he was doing was very science-based, very math-based. Um, I hadn't a great deal of interest in maths, being honest about it. So I, Still really don't <laughs> but the science even the, the amount of um let's say non-practical stuff i thought was pretty heavy at that time as well uh, so I, I actually went to um a university agriculture specific college in england um and it was quite a big decision at the time i was 17 years of age and um we took uh, i took a decision that i didn't want to really go down the road of UCD because it was very science orientated, very um, how do you say book orientated. Um, the agricultural college is Harper Adams that I went to um, was a lot more practical, and um, so it was which I liked. Now, as it turns out, there was also a lot of uh, science to it as well. Um, you know, as you um, get farther into it in second year towards you know, but. The one thing I would say is that for any young person that they should really think about what they actually want to do with their lives. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people um, nowadays they, they don't put enough thought into, well, this is actually what I'm interested in. This is what, uh, this is the college that offer these courses, but is that the course that actually, you know, does it really suit me or not? 
Now, I, I was extremely lucky in that I was sort of had a, a keen interest in agriculture anyway, um, because I, I actually put down on my CEO form, I, I don't know what it's called nowadays, but um, put down on my college choice, the first one was actually UCD in agricultural science, the second one was a doctor, the second one was a brain surgeon, which was never, ever going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically the career guidance teacher said, well, you're leaving yourself one option. And, and and I said, yeah, I said, plan A is plan B. So this is what I'm going to do, irrespective. This is what I want to do. So then uh, it was after the leaving results come out that we actually, that I actually said, right, now I have to actually take look at this seriously and see what my plan actually is here. And that's where we looked at uh, that the UK. Um, and there will be a lot of students thinking about going to the UK and it's a big thing as you said Dara for 17 year old to be brave enough to go to a different country and you know without a support network around them so would you have any advice about studying in the UK for young people? Yeah yeah um, be, be honest about it I, when I went to the high college in the UK um, I knew nobody uh, I had it wasn't I uh, had no friends, let's say it was going also or anything like that. I went on my own. Uh, that was quite tough, uh, quite daunting for the first, I would say, three months. No, not probably, probably exaggerating there, probably about maybe two months or so. Uh, it was quite tough. Um, I'd say for the first couple of weeks, I got homesick. Now, a bit of that, I was playing, playing Gaelic football as well, and uh, our local team went into a county final. And they uh, lost by a point, and the sort of were saying, "Well, if we had a full back, we might have helped." But uh, he set off to England on us, you know. But um, that was tough at that time. Did you recommend now, it? Absolutely, it was by far, I'd say, the best decision I've ever made. Um, because after that month passed, you started to you started to make new friends but you made them because you had an interest in what you were doing they had an interest in in very some very similar like my friend my best friends now are the friends i met in the uk um you know there was a lot of a lot of other irish guys traveling as well and and, and girls that traveled over to the uk to the college i i i taught say for two or three days that you know i'm going to be on my own here and that there's going to be no um, Irish people, really, you know, to, that it can, let's say, that uh, I suppose understands where, where our backgrounds are, or where we're coming from, and uh, just even for banter or crack or whatever. Um, and that, that wasn't the case at all, you know. But it did take us, but I'd say after about maybe a month, uh, it ended up, it turned around completely the opposite direction. And... If, if anything, it's, it's, it was an education of more than just education alone, um, in that we found it for ourselves. We, you know, we grew very close together because um, we didn't go home at, obviously at the weekends because it was too far. So we had to sort out food for ourselves. We had to do our own laundry, which was interesting by then. Um, you know, so we... we you know, it, 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 we found very strong friendships um, out of that. But it also, I, I think it left us very rounded. And it left us that um, we were able to deal with different situations that, uh, let's say, we hadn't a fallback plan or we, we, we couldn't go back to our parents and say, well, look, um, you know, can you help me out here? Mm -hmm. they, weren't just, they weren't there, you know. So what happened after college? Talk us through a bit of the jobs that you led you to start in your own company. So did you work in the same industry? And, you know, talk us through that. So what was your first job out of college? My first job out of college was working for a company called Tanko. Uh, they were a machinery manufacturer where they manufactured um, essentially bail wrappers. And at that time, they were reasonably poor at it. There was, there was a lot of uh, a lot of issues, a lot of breakdowns, uh, a lot of uh, let's say problem solving. Uh, we were all full time trying to source parts to get the machines going. During the summer, I was held for leather, um, and 
it was the putting out fires left, right, and centre, basically keep machines going, and you know it it was very much excuse me, uh, very much um hands on, get the job done, uh, think for yourself and get it sorted. There was, there was no sort of right. What we do here, will we have a meeting about this. It was sort of like get the problem sorted. We we'll sort it out. We we'll, we we'll, we'll have a meeting afterwards and see where we go from there. But uh, it was actually a very good place to work, even though we simply. I was fighting all the time, but um, it was interesting, very interesting. Um, I went from there then to work for, for a company called Abbey, Abbey Machinery, uh, which would be a successful company in, I suppose, grassland machinery manufacturing. Um, I would have covered a reasonably big area for those. Um, I was a sales manager for a number of years, um, and I would have been covering, say, from... Northern Ireland into Scotland, North England, uh, small part of Wales. So I, I would have done a, quite a bit of travelling as well uh, back over to the UK. Uh, I suppose the fact that I had already been there for a number of years uh, would have helped that role anyway, you know. So um, now it was prior to, um, when was it? Yeah, prior to I started working at Tanko actually. When I came back from the UK, um, I went to America for nine months. I worked in Boston as a a, a plaster. I became a, a qualified plaster on the plane on the way over. And um, so we basically it was like a a, a nine month working holiday essentially. Um, and it it was it was very good. But after nine months, it sort of went right. We had our fun. Uh, the crack was good. Uh, now it's time to drive where. I suppose my interests lay. Uh, as I probably said at the start, I do get bored very easily. Uh, I realised that building wasn't going to be a career path for me. So um, that's when I'm back and started working in the agricultural industry. Um, let's say from, from um, Abbey Machinery, then I went to Volac, um, which would have started off my, uh, I suppose, nutrition path. Well, we would have Sorry, to, we would have touched on the whole nutrition side of things in relation to diet feeding, uh, total mixed ration feeding um, in Abbey. And then it sort of led on from there to Volac. Uh, then it would have went from Volac to a company called uh, Kilco. And then it was at that point that, that I said that now I've sort of, with, with, I think it was with Kilco that we took. I, I took, I think, two or three new products. I built a brand uh, in Ireland for the company. And at that point, that, that between conversations with John and myself said, uh, I have a degree or we have a degree of confidence here. that We can do this um, and do it better. Can uh, I ask, Dara, like what gave you the confidence? Because it's very brave to start a new business. And you I mean, you said yourself that you have a degree in ag science, but you didn't study accounting or you didn't study... Um, marketing or so what gave you the confidence to start your own um because you knew the probably industry. yeah probably i i would say erica um the planning really um as, as i said at the start we would have spent about a, about 12 months looking at looking at the market um looking at the products that we wanted to bring to the market, look at what we can improve, look at what actually would work from a cost point of view. And um, we put a lot of time and effort into um, actually the planning and making sure that this would work. Like it, it was one thing that, uh, that our accountant had said to us from when we went to our first bank meeting. Um, we walked out of the, the meeting and uh, I remember the accountant saying, that was a very good presentation of your five-year business plan. He says, them figures are, are, are they're, they're highly ambitious. And I, I just, I, I remember saying to the guy, I said, I didn't do the business plan for the bank. He says, I done the business plan for the business. And he sort of looked at me and says, that's interesting because everyone seems to do it to try and get the loan that they want 
took the money to start a business, where I took it, is this actually business going to work? Will these figures stack up and does it work? And after five years, the accountant actually said to me that there are very few businesses actually follow through on that. And we will actually take out the business plan and go through it and say, where are we going right here? Where are we going wrong? Now, we're, we're very critical of each other as well and, and everyone within the business. So we're sort of, I don't know, fairly regimental as well. And there's a lot of that is very boring stuff for any young person listening to this going, Jesus, this sounds like, a, like an army camp or something. But if, if that works and your fundamental uh, business acumen works, everything else will carry through and then everything else becomes a lot easier and a lot more, um, I suppose, a lot more enjoyable, you know. Um, give the young people uh, an overview of your day. Like, what's you're a managing director of your own company. So what's yeah. your day? Um, <laughs> What's the typical day? Or I, typical... Yeah. What, what I do is, let's say, every Monday morning, I will get up, um, drop the baby off the crash when I remember not to do that. Um, I will take out my diary. I will make a list of what I'm going to do each day for the next five days and see what I achieve. Then that's where it all starts to go pear-shaped and you get a phone call. And you go this direction, that direction. It's like the, the, the slide that Mags put up. I told it very apt at the start, where you go from here to here, and that's success. It goes. And, and you're all over the place. Because you have, to, you have to react to the market, and you have to react to what the customers require as far as well. So you're chopping and changing all the time. But fundamentally, I think at the end of the day, when you can look back and say, I've achieved my core goals. And like, let's say, to give you a typical day, um, I arrive in the office usually around quarter, 10 to nine. The first thing I do is go through emails from what's coming in from the night before and see if there's anything there that, that needs to be done now. If it doesn't need to be done now, I, I sort of park that and they look at then right. Now we put in place what our objectives are for the week and roll that out to whatever, be it the sales team or be it the guys in the warehouse or whatever. Um, and then you sort of go from there to start into working on your objectives. Um, so the, the roles are very, very varied uh, for, for every day. The, it's probably the one thing I love about the job. The variance is is dramatic. And um, just to give you an idea, uh, yesterday evening at six o'clock, I was on a farm looking at animals to just assess some performance levels where the farmer had wanted to push calves on a bit better to try and get them out to grass quicker to save on costs. And we were looking at different ideas of how we can do that. The previous previous Wednesday evening at six o'clock, uh, one of the guys in the warehouse was after blocking a filter and a forklift. He uh, had to go to a meeting, so he went off, and I was standing there with a uh, white shirt, cream trousers, uh, changing a diesel filter in a forklift because it had to be working by eight o'clock the next morning because containers were moving in and out. So th that, that started to give you an idea of the variance. Um, and... I basically spend every Monday night or Monday evening going through um, invoices. So uh, all our invoices go out on a Tuesday morning. So everything is looked at, checked, and the price is correct, products right, that everything is um, goes out without mistakes, and that's done religiously every Monday night uh, for the week. Um, on a Friday evening, we will. I will always do before I leave the office, I always do say backups. Uh, I look to make sure stock is okay. You know, that there's no, there's no, let's say emergencies that's gonna cause trouble or cause hassle by the time you get to Monday morning. That if there's something there that needs to be addressed, it's addressed on Friday evening. And um, then we will all have a quick 
I will always have a quick uh, ring around with the guys on a Monday morning as well, just to make sure that everyone um, knows what their objectives are for the week. Well, that actually leads into um, a question here from one of the young people. So what's it like to manage a team and to manage people and what are the challenges that are managing people? Um, I think the main thing that I, I find is honesty. Um, I think if, if you're honest with the people about, the ex, about what you expect from them, I think most people will respect that. Um, We've, we've one of our head guys in the warehouse. He's a bit of a character. And, uh, you know, like we, I'm very honest with him. I say, look, at, I'm, I'm not happy with that there. That has to be changed. End of story. Now, he'll usually give me a smart answer back to why he put something upside down or whatever, you know. But, um, like, I think once they're actually honest, I think you get honesty back. And uh, the biggest thing, I suppose, at the moment is, is just motivating people, you know, um, is to keep people, let's say, uh, motivated that they're happy with what they're doing. Um, and that's, it's an interesting year, actually, to keep people motivated. Because a lot of our, let's say, our background staff is, they're, they're always happy enough. Uh, sales people are a bit trickier in terms of motivation present because they're used to being out calling out to people for the, let's say every day they're calling into merchant customers they're going in and they're talking to people all the time now they're behind masks or they're on phones or they're on zoom and it's not as personable and um it's tougher so it's keeping people motivated they're like the biggest thing that we find is that we keep information to them to let them know this is how you're doing, this is how you're doing comparison to last year, um, this is why you're doing really well, and we concentrate on the positive. So we say, right, this, if this was you're doing really well, why, why, why is that working? If that's working for this customer, can we replicate it with this other customer? So it's it's all about looking at the positives all the time. Um, is the main thing. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, just yeah. one last question before you invite Mags back to the panel, Dara. Yeah. Do you love running your own business? What's the favourite thing about it? Um, the variety. Obviously. Definitely, def definitely the variety. Um, and that's not to say now there's not tough decisions to be made as well. Um, but the variety in from one day to the next is definitely the most attractive. Um, Part of it, um, you never get you never get two days. You don't. Yeah, that's 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 the that's the best part, Ari. Um, thanks a million, Dara. We're just going to invite um, Mags back and just ask um, just generic questions to both of you and just try and get maybe different perspectives. So, a lot of the questions we get on these webinars are about work experience, and so many of the mentors have. Um, advise young people to go and work in a shop for a day or whatever it is that they're interested in or go if they want to be an accountant to work in an office for the day would like Dari you um, you know you said you were involved in agriculture like or you were interested in it would you advise the young people if they want to go out and do business to get a you know ask their neighbour for work experience in an office or ask you know a relation for help or something would you uh, advise them to go uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think it's it's uh, something that does make a huge amount of sense. Like let's say when you look at uh, say like a transition year, um, where young people get an opportunity to see actually on a day to day basis to what they could be doing down the line or what sort of environment to be working in. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity where guys can pick. And sorry, I did think I, but I mean, uh, obviously, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but where you can pick different, a, an industry or, or something that you believe you're interested in, that you can actually go and get a piece of that and see what that is like. Um, I'll, I remember having a conversation with my nephew who was looking at doing uh, veterinary. And I said to, to Gary, uh, why don't you come out with me for a day? And 
maybe do a week's work on the veterinary surgeons uh, or veterinary officers as well before you go down that road. And he, he found that he actually wasn't as interested in it as he thought he was. Mm-hmm. And he he changed tact and he's actually he's studying um to be a science and math, math teacher now. Um so he 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 thought the idea of it was better than the actual application. Um now so- it's something also that that like we had uh, an incident last year with one of our sales reps, uh, where he again he thought he was happy to take the job in that role and he pushed for that. But after a while he realized that uh, he actually nearly preferred where he was in the in his role in the warehouse. That he actually prepared that in comparison to it, but luckily enough for him, he the option. But um, a lot of people don't. The, the, you know, if you had the option to get a, a bit of a not experience even, but just to get a taste first, it makes a big difference. And the, the, just to mention another thing there Eric, as well is that education is highly important, but it's not the be all and end all of this either. The, the best sales rep that we have. Um, I think he has a certificate in pharma. Um, he's probably the least qualified person that we have, and he's by far the best person that we have in that role. So, because he's really interested in what he's doing, he loves it. He loves talking to people. He, you know, he he gets on with people because the let's say when he goes to talk about the subject, he's talking about people can see that he. He, he really cares for what he's talking about. So they can they can read that off him. And he gets on really well and does really well in that role. And if if you want to put him, let's say, very technical, he he, he doesn't need to do that. He you know, like he's really successful at what he does. And he is, you know, he's not and highly educated. And, and but but that's worked extremely well. And that leads on like Mags, I mean like you said, you worked in Supermax, you know, you worked in Supermax when you were in college as well. So, like, how important is a work ethic um, as well as, you know, the skills that young people might be bringing to a job? Really important. Um, it's, you know, it, it's anything else can be taught, but like attitude to you bring yourself and, you know, um, having a work ethic, ethic and having a positive attitude are two of the best things you can bring to the table. Everything else is great. It's great to have skills. It's great to have the education. But without those critical ingredients, you don't have the motivation to push on. Um, you know, and so like it's really, really, really important. Um, I'm good to ask a question. Do you still set goals for yourself, Max? Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, very much so. And it actually similar to what Dara was saying about he looks at his diary for the five days ahead. Um, I would always. I kind of tend to break my goals into what do I need to achieve this month and then I break it down by week and I literally go through it and then on a bigger scale I will have like from a work perspective I'll have a business plan of things that have to be done this year um, and then I set goals for myself as well and uh, you know it's it's a way of kind of looking forward and it's a way of being able to take yourself out of where you are now and look ahead and um, so I think it's I think it's really really important but it is important when you're setting goals to make sure that they're achievable, to make sure that they stretch you um, and, to, you know, to make sure that you have the ingredients to help those goals to work. Because if you set goals that are too stretched, you can put yourself in a position where you're setting yourself up to fail. And if you set goals that are too easy, then you set yourself up um, in a position where, you know, they're not giving you the motivation that you need. But I read a very interesting um, book at, in January this year called Atomic Habits. And... Um, and it's really good because what it talks about is it talks about goals, but it talks about how, you know, if it's a habit that you're trying to get into and it's a new habit and it's maybe uncomfortable for you. So that might be, I don't know, getting into the study frame of mind or getting into going out for a walk, whatever it is. The theory in this is that you do it in tiny, tiny little bits. And um, so tiny, tiny little bits, but you commit to doing it every day. And by doing it every day, you build it into, into your your day and into your life and um, it, it's very interesting and um, it's, wor- it's worth a look. No and there are skills that you carry with you throughout the life if you can set those goals break those goals down. Um, 
So Dara, you were saying, you know, leading on from saying that education isn't everything and we talked about how important work ethic is. So on these webinars, we talk a lot about the soft skills that young people need, like communication and being able to talk to people. And uh, Mags, you talked about planning earlier on. So what are the soft skills that you think young people, you know, could be practicing now um, through their involvement in maybe the GA or any kind of local groups that they're involved in? Um, I, I think the most important skill that anyone carries with them through their work in life is communication skills. And the ability to communicate, communicate well, is something that um, is just, it, it just brings you so far. Um, and I, I think it's something that's not concentrated enough even from a secondary school level that young people aren't, they're not included in enough, um, let's say, areas that, that brings on communication skills and helps communication skills. Um, that it's, it's, it's highly important, pretty much within any role, within be it any business or any job you do. And it's, uh, it's the one thing that you remark from from younger people nowadays to say, well, there's a person who who will do well because they they communicate effectively and they communicate well. Um, you know, it it, yeah. it does carry so far, and I think I think it's, it's highly important. And like Max, would you agree? I mean, we went to college together. I remember doing presentations in different languages and being how daunting it was. But wouldn't you agree, and for the young people out here who are saying, oh, I'm not very good at public speaking or I'm not good at speaking or communicating, it is a skill that you practice for life, isn't it? It's Absolutely. really born with it. A hundred percent. And I endorse exactly what Dara said about it. It's the most important skill that you can have. And look, everybody feels nervous um, when you're doing it, but you practice it. And, you know, there, there's the likes of Toastmasters is great for getting involved in. If you're really nervous of public speaking, they're great for bringing on your public speaking. Um, and it's practice, practice, practice. And um, I lectured part time for 10 years. I had to stand up in front of people and every single time my stomach would be doing absolute hoops. But, you know, somebody said to me, I went to a guy, Terry Harmer, and he does presentation skills coaching. And I went to him and he said to me, he said, the day, Max, that you stand up and you don't have those butterflies. He said, that's the day you don't care anymore. He said, you don't want that day. So, you know, it's, it's nerves are OK, but absolutely work on your communication skills. And there are ways of getting involved in things that will help those communication skills, you know, within your club or within things that you're involved with, you know, offer to stand up and do the welcomes or, you know, get involved with Toastmasters. And I would just add to that another skill that's hugely important and it's connected um, is networking. It's, um, I don't know if any of you um, probably heard of Bill Yeo. He set up the Coder Dojo movement across the world. Um, and he always says that your net network is your net worth. But what that means basically is the people who you're in school with now, and Dara is talking about when he went to the UK and the friends he made in college there, and um, you know, those networks that you build up over the course of your life and they start in school. Those networks are so important as you go on because it's how you kind of connect with people who are involved in certain areas. And um, now Erica leveraged her college network. That's why I'm speaking here tonight. You know, it's, it's the network is really important. And by having a strong network, it actually helps. It, it, it's inherent to that, that your communication skills improve as well. So, you know, that connectivity, that's really, really important. And I think particularly now um, with the way that so much has gone online, it's really important that you put an effort into making sure that you're building those connections and, you know, just engaging with people because that will become more and more important as, as your career and your life goes on. Um, Dara... You know, a lot of the young people, um, you know, will be looking to get jobs and are going for part time jobs as the restrictions are lifted and things are opening up. So as the person who's hired many people and interviewed people, what advice would you give to young people about um, their CV? So that it's not just about the subjects or the grades they got in school. What else would you advise young people to include? Um, um, I, th I think the, um, to demonstrate their inclusion in other areas other than let's say just work and education I think it's quite important I think you can read into a lot 
of what a person is like and and you know whether they're outgoing, whether they're easy, easy going, easy to get on with, when really get on with other people by um different activities that they do themselves. Um, so let's say obviously education is up there, it's important, highly important, but it's not the be all and end all. Um your work and your suitability, I suppose, to your experience to a role that you're looking at. I, I presume, Erica, you're looking at sort of at more more than just, just part time. Yeah, it's just or say you, you've when you're farther than that, is it? Or yeah, you've kind of said it. Like so, you but like you would advise them to get out and get as much experience as they can to get involved in clubs or groups or whatever yeah. they're interested in, whether it's Coda Dojo yeah. or GA. But that yeah. the learning in all of those. Um, I, I, I think as an employer that um, you will look at people that are involved with different areas and different, um, be it sports or be it uh, different nice. clubs, mm-hmm. it's the inclusion that they're interested in other things and getting involved with things in, in various areas, it doesn't really I suppose, matter as such, but, but uh, that, they, that they're willing to get out there. Um, looks on uh, like I certainly would look on it very favorable. And last question before we finish up Mags, what advice would you give to your 16 year old self? Um, I would just go back and say stop stressing and worrying uh, you know um, it's you can really catastrophize things um, and particularly the older I get the less I stress um, but if I could give myself if I could give a gift to my younger self it would be just don't worry about things so much um, you know, there's there's always another way. There is always another way. And, um, you know, don't get stuck on what's not working right now. I wish I'd known that when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, I wish we all knew that. Okay, so thanks a million. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending. And Jimmy is just going to um, finish up here. And I'm going to launch a poll for you. Your final job of the night is a poll which has been launched right now. Just three short questions. So please take the time to complete it. On behalf of Faroiga, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We hope it was beneficial and that you gained some insight into a potential career path. For those of you who would like to get involved in Faroiga or that would like to learn more about our programs and how they can benefit you, you will receive an email with all the information you need in the coming days. I want to sincerely thank our panelists who have so generously given their time and shared such valuable advice. Faroiga is hosting more career webinars next week. Um, and you are welcome to attend them <clears throat> if you wish. You can do so by registering through Eventbrite. Thanks again, everyone, and good night. <laughs>